From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, praise God. We've been waiting on you. We're ready to get into our Father's Word. A new subject this evening while we're between books. I just want to talk to you about the beast. The beast of Revelation. We hear a great deal about it. Some call it this. Some call it that. Some say it's a number. Some go as far as saying, no, it's a machine in Belgium. Hey, it's written in our Father's Word what the beast is. Why do people play guessing games and deceive people when we can go to our Father's Word and understand it totally and clearly? And I thank Him for the Word whereby we have that assurity. Let's just thank Him in the precious name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. The beast. Naturally, I want you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. We could even call this the beast chapter. But now, God uses symbology. Why does he use symbology? Because symbology, when it's correctly understood, uh, makes it very simple as to what God's meaning and subject matter is. And that's what he wants you as a Christian to know and to understand. Man fears only the unknown. So if you don't know about the beast, if you don't know what it consists of, you're going to be a little afraid of it, a little leery. Well, I don't want anything to do with no beast. Well, you might if you know it's your destiny. But you might have a great deal to do with it. In opposition to it. You might find that all your teachings... From God's Word, your growth in that Word and in your Father was designed specifically to bring you to a point to serve your Father against the beast. Now, what are we talking about then? God uses creatures, anything created as an example, as a uh, giving it a, in symbology a meaning sometimes due to horticulture, anthropology, zoology, whatever the case might be. You must become proficient within those subjects to truly understand if he uses something such as an eagle. What does it mean? Well, Father's Word explains. So, he explains as well what this beast is. Let's read of it. Chapter 13 in the book of Revelation. Revelation means to reveal and to uncover. So let us uncover the identity of the beast. All right. Chapter 13, the book of Revelation, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand. I want you to picture John. He's standing upon the sand of a beach, on a sandy beach, of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. I saw him come up out of the water, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Do you know why people wear crowns? Because they're a king or a queen of some particular festival or location. So that's basically self-explanatory, is it not? And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy, which is to say his purpose was to defame the name and the word of God. The whole thing designed for this. Now, you know that in God's natural creation, we do not have seven-headed monsters. We just don't have them. They're not there. Therefore, he is using symbology. But do you know that God doesn't give you symbology without a very clear and specific explanation. Don't ever let man mess you around as to, about, as to who this beast is or what it is. First of all, I want to make one point, and then we're going directly to the explanation. 
you must understand this one thing or you're never going to understand end time prophecy concerning the beast system. In this book of Revelation, this chapter rather, in the book of Revelation, we find two beasts. One is political, one is religious. Naturally, if it has more than one head, it's political. A religious leader, however, though, is singular. And we have one head. And of course, that one head is the chief religious leader of the end times in a spurious sense, which is to say falsehood, lies, deception. Naturally, then, we know from common sense that we're talking here about a multi-headed political system, meaning there's going to be the crowns or kings. We're going to have ten kings. But you don't have to play guessing games. Turn over quite simply to the 17th chapter of this great book of Revelation. I want to pick it up with the 12th verse. Let's take the horns first. Now, first of all, come with me. Observe uh, John standing on a beach overlooking a sea of water and this thing comes from it, rises out of the water. Now let's understand what the water is, what the horns are, what the heads are, etc. Okay, um, verse 12 of Revelation 17. He has just told us in the prior verse that Antichrist will only be one hour the son of perdition and that these kings will only be kings for one hour. We hear of it here now, picking it up in verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest. You saw the ten horns? What are they? The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Now take the guessing games out of it. It's, they're quite simply ten kings. No more, no less. Which have received no kingdom as yet. Now this is very important in prophecy. None of those ten kings, they rule simultaneously. They rule all rather at the same time. They're not a, a, a king line that in secession one after the other, but all at one time. But they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. What beast? The religious beast, of course who is the son of perdition. He goes into perdition from verse 11. That will be the religious beast. But I want to take part of the mythology that man has placed upon this through the simplicity that God has placed in the horns. Horns always, they are an Hebrew idiom that means power. All right? This is an earthly power. So these ten horns are ten kings, their power on this earth, but they will not one little, not the least of them will reign except for one hour when the son of perdition comes into being. That also is symbolic for that one hour describes the five month reign in Revelation chapter 9. I'm not going to digress a great deal because I want to stick to the subject. What is the explanation of the thing John saw rise. Now we know now that when the horns came up on those seven heads, that they're ten people. We're talking about ten world leaders. Ten world leaders that will rule only after Antichrist or the religious beast appears upon this earth. So take all the, shake all the uh, fuzzy wuzzies out of it that you've been taught and see ten men coming up out of the water, meaning appearing on the scene. It's that simple. Okay, verse 13. Let's go further with this. These have one mind. In other words, they all think exactly the same and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, meaning they totally uh, pledge their allegiance and their loyalty to that world religious leader. That world religious leader, you're going to be told by a few knuckleheads that it's a false prophet. Hey, friend, the false prophet will not surface and make himself known worldwide. Neither will Elijah, the good prophet. But this uh, religious beast, who, who is none other than Antichrist, the role, the dragon, the role that Satan played in the world that was in this one as well, in the final closure, 14, 
They shall make war with the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? I think you would know. It's Jesus Christ. In other words, these ten kings all have the same thought in mind. That's to pledge allegiance to instead of Christ and make war with the Christ, the Lamb slain, the Lamb of God. And the Lamb shall overcome them. Praise God, we've got the victory. Do you know why? God is calling out some and giving them intelligence to know and to understand the simplicity in which he taught. As we see the superpowers in the world, peace, 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 that's being cried. As ten leaders certainly will take over, this, and then the seven heads uh, being seven dominions, regions, whatever you want to call them, geographical locations worldwide with all leaders paying respect to this supernatural entity that is able to perform miracles in the sight of people. Hey, don't spiritualize it away, friend. These things are facts, and they shall come to pass. Now, many of you have wondered about that beast, that first one. Beast, what a... No, it's just ten kings. No more, no less. That's it, friend. Ten kings, ten earthly men as far as the headship is concerned. For he is the Lord of lords, we're back to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Do you know why I emphasize the fact that some of you are called, that you're God's elect, that you have eyes to see and ears to hear? It's because you know you do. And you're not buying the stuff that is commonly taught. You'd rather use a little common sense and take away the mysteries that people utilize as scripture lawyers to build people when the word is so simple. The beast is headed by ten kings. And the kings are headed by a world religious leader. We'll document that back in the 13th chapter. But they come across the lamb, the lamb slain, of course. Why is it he called the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Because he will appear on the scene as Lord of Lords and King of Kings with the saints and shall defeat them. It's well written throughout this book. 15. And he saith unto me, The waters. Now, now here's the sea. I want to explain to you what that sea is that these ten men rose up from. It's really a mystery. Listen to it. How complicated and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, had we begin, that old great harlot, mother, mystery Babylon, was sitting upon waters, which is the same waters that these ten rose from, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. In other words, the waters that the ten kings appear on the surface from are simply the multitudes, all races, all colors, all creeds, the entire world population. You've got ten kings that rise up from seven dominions over the people of the world. And there's, is that difficult? So you see, we didn't see some creature rise up out of a sea. We simply saw ten little old earthly kings rise up out of the people, meaning they were human, they were of the people. They had a dominion. They had seven dominions. Domain. Um, and they ruled. But they ruled under the false Christ. So, what is it that this, well, who is this whore then? It's really quite simple. It's all people that are expecting this great religious leader that's going to rapture them out, and they don't know that spurious Messiah, this one comes first, and they're going to be deceived. There is a warning, and God is allowing it to be delivered just before that day of the Lord. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you'd better thank your father for it. Okay, uh, 16. Listen closely. There's no great mystery about the beast. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, that's those, what are the ten horns on the beast? Do you need to be reminded? They're ten kings that are part of the system. These shall hate the whore. The great church, the apostolic church, that's to say those that go in, rather those that go into apostasy. They are deceived. 
Th these leaders actually hate her. They don't stand for her or with her. And shall make her desolate and naked. You know why they're going to make her naked? Because they're going to take every righteous act that the church has ever committed and strip her of it because she will worship this false one thinking it is the lamb and burn her with fire. They're going to eat her naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. In other words, this is the stinging burn of the locust. The stinging burn, rather, of the scorpion in Revelation chapter 9, 4. That's what they're going to burn her with. They can't kill her, but they can sure sting her. 17, listen closely. Now, now back up again. You see, ten rulers rise up from the peoples of this world, all languages, and seven nations, seven dominions, rather. Seven regions, if you prefer. They have the great religious beast over them. They pay their total and complete respect to him. Their purpose is to, make, is to deceive this harlot, the church, the false church, the church that falls into the apostasy. That is to say, they change their professed belief in one day because they truly love the real Jesus. But they don't know because they haven't understood God's word that the fake Jesus comes first. Okay, now listen closely. 17. For God, who has, for Yahweh, Almighty God, has put in their hearts to fulfill His will. Do you understand that those kings, even though their loyalty is to Satan, that they are fulfilling God's will because the negative part of God's plan must come to pass to fulfill the scripture. God is still in control. So you saints, you set aside ones. That's what the word saints means. How precious you are that we have the victory. To fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, these ten rulers, it is God's will that they agree and give their kingdom to the religious system. Until the words, until what? Don't you read over that. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. How fast they are being filled today. As you look at the Persian Gulf. Are you familiar with it? We're going to get into the book of Daniel before too long. And perhaps I might tell you this is preparation for it. For it speaks and goes into much detail on this same subject. And I don't want you to see when we have the truth before us. God's word shall be fulfilled. That's why Jesus, when he would be asked a question, he would say, haven't you read? It is written. Are you stupid? Do you not know it's written? It's been before you all the time. Why do you ask a question like that? That's what he's saying. He was disappointed, disturbed and disgusted sometimes. He groaned when he was asked simple, stupid questions. Because it was written all the time. But people must be taught into the simplicity of God's word. That's why you can count on it. As it is written, so shall it come to pass. Verse 18. And the woman, this is that great harlot, the old whore, which thou sawest is that great city. You see, it wasn't a woman at all. What great city? Which reigneth over the kings of the earth. You know what it is? Babylon. Well, what does Babylon mean? It means confusion. Confusion concerning the real truth of God's word and God's plan that must be fulfilled. That's why they are, they become um, the, uh, the, um, a part of the apostasy. That's the falling away that, P, that Paul mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, hey, you got a little confused about my first letter about gathered in the air and I want to write this second letter to you so that first one doesn't mix you up about our gathering back to Christ. It's not going to happen until after this son of perdition, the one read of in verse 11 here, comes to this earth and sits in the temple of God claiming to be God to deceive all those that will participate in the falling away. Friend, you're not going anywhere until these events take place. Who is that great whore, that great harlot? 
It's the confused church and all the citizens and languages of this earth that have not studied our Father's plan and will, for it will happen as the Creator of all things has so declared. Who are you going to be? And who are you going to believe? Then you've heard some idiot tell you that this beast is a machine. What a lie. What deception. That's all part of the confusion. Or, or some idiot is going to tell you that this beast and this woman is one particular church and they rise to the forefront and take the front seat in the whole church because they haven't studied their father's word. They're blind and deceived and they're disgusting when they should be scholars of our father's simple plan. Now let's go over it again. How can they say that it's one church, that it's one uh, this or that, a machine, when your father says, hey, those ten horns are ten men. They're ten kings. That's all. They're, over, they're, they, they're only going to come to power for one little old bitty hour when Antichrist is on this earth. Otherwise, they're not going to have any power. But they're going to give every nth of their loyalty to him. And you can count on it. That's the way it's going to be. And they're going to rule over the people of this world, not because they love them, but they will actually hate them and strip all their righteous acts because they serve Satan rather than Almighty God. Do you find that confusing? Now, now when you read it drawn out and explained what that beast, sim using symbolism as God was, that it's ten men, don't ever let anybody confuse you. The simplicity in which Christ taught is really too much for some minds because they must complicate or confuse because they are part of that harlot church, Babylon. Beware of those that confuse in their teaching as to what the simplicity of the fact is. What did John see rise from the sea? Ten king rulers and a deceived bunch of people. The waters were the people and they're confused uh, and who was the whore? She's the apostasy itself, that great city Babylon, which is the confused state of mind. What does Babel, Babylon mean? It comes from the base root Babel, which means to Babel, confusion. And how some people like to confuse people. So will you not forget that? That's a world political system. So jot it down in your margin. This first beast that rises from the sea, it's ten kings. That will rule one hour or a one hour period symbolically, the five months period of Antichrist. And they will deceive the world if it's possible. But they won't love the people of the world. They'll use them. Verse 2, back to Revelation 13, verse 2. Let's go with it. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. The dragon is Satan. Always is, always has been. Was in the world it was, Revelation chapter 12. It's his title in the, at the end of the last age just before the fall. And it is his title in the end of this earth age just before the overthrow, the fall. We will be getting into the book of Daniel and I will explain these various governments the leopard, the bear, and the lion, uh, in, and the, um, the beast that is not necessarily described. We will explain him in detail. We're going deeper than we've ever gone before by the gift of the Holy Spirit that simplifies prophecy whereby people can understand. So, these simply, as for the time, moment in the time being, has always been the power of the Kenites. Down through the ages, Daniel will clarify, bringing us up to the end generation, whereby Antichrist shall take hope, Antichrist shall take over. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now what are we talking about here? One of its heads, what are we talking We're talking about a political system. Its power operates on loyalty to Antichrist. We see them start trying together and to come to power. 
You see it today when you see Esau and Jacob meet at the same table and sign peace treaties. It's very biblical. It's part of God's scripture. I'm talking about the United States of America and, and uh, Russia. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Do you know who healed the wound? You'll find out in the next verse. Who wounded him? It will be those people that know their God and stand against, if you would. People can't get along anyway. And until Antichrist appears on the scene, they're never going to quite get this peace, 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 peace thing all together. And that's why God told you when you hear that cry, they'll be careful because sudden destruction is soon coming, meaning the dragon. Now listen closely, verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Who did the beast totally give its power to? The dragon, which is who? Satan, that old dragon, the devil. You'll read of it back in the 12th chapter. It's one of his titles. And they worship the beast. They worship the political system saying, Who is likened to this political system, this beast? Who is able to make war with him? Who is able to make war with this one world, total power and peace, with all total disarmament? Praise God, they will say. You can't make war if all nations are hit by one, and that's the dragon, and they will be as a religious leader. Verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's forty and two moons. Anytime a prophecy is given in our Father's Word and it is given in days, that's solar. That's a, a prophecy given to the children of light. Anytime it is given in moons, which is of the night, it's of the devil. And it's a prophecy concerning his reign. You were always taught that um, 1260 days is three and a half years and 42 months is three and a half years. Well, there's a 10 day difference, dear one. That 10 days could be very different in as much as the children of the day have a 10 day time of preparation if they understand God's word. Enough said on that subject for the moment. I understand this. A, a solar day is a little bit longer than one moon day, all right? Because the moon doesn't quite uh, uh, get all the way around in one day, all right, etc. Six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. In other words, he, who's dwelling in heaven at this time? Almighty God in Christ at his right hand. Well, what is this, his tabernacle? Do you, have you not read that God tabernacled with men in a tabernacle of flesh? It's the many-membered body. He's going to blaspheme them for telling the truth. That also is covered in Daniel in much more detail. We'll be going into it in that detail. How is it that he blasphemes the name of God? Paul made it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a chapter I was just referring to a moment ago. He says, Paul, that the son of perdition, that one which is Antichrist, will stand in the temple of God, the tabernacle of God, claiming to be God. Hey, that's blasphemy. And listen, dear Christian, those of you that are deceived and think that the first supernatural Messiah that appears on this earth very soon is Jesus, you're going to blaspheme too because you're going to worship Satan. You're going to turn yourself into a prostitute because you're supposed to remain a virgin until Jesus Christ returns to this earth to take part in the true wedding, not this fake wedding that's coming up soon. Verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Do you know who the saints are? That's the set-aside ones, the called ones, those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, and to overcome them. That means to deliver them up. Did 
Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 not tell you that you would be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, that you were not to premeditate what you would say beforehand, but that the Holy Spirit himself would speak through you at that moment? For what purpose? For a witness and a testimony to the fact that this fake was sitting in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus to rapture people out, not the true Messiah. You, this generation, will see this come to pass. If you don't believe it now, you believe it when it does come to pass, for indeed it shall. It shall happen in and to this generation. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. In other words, he brought one worldism into a total uh, success. That's what the religious system is, is to called and be called one worldism. So it shall be. There will be no more wars, there will be no wars made with it, for all nations will belong to it. Verse 8, you listen closely. He's going to make war with the saints, meaning delivering them up, converting them. What does a religious leader do? Does he kill people to convert them? No. He converts them through revival. And you better get your mind in that frame to understand that's the danger of Antichrist is false teachings and revival. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. That's what it said. It said every living soul. No, it said all shall worship him. Whose? Now here we have a qualifier. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, God's elect that were predestined were chosen because in the last dragon episode, they had the courage and the guts to stand up and be men. And that is to say, people, no gender. People of the living God. And so shall they again in the near future. Do you want to be a champion of your people have you known you had a destiny and a purpose all your life? Have you not been able to be fulfilled from the so-called church because it does not break down the word of God in the simplicity in which your father wrote it to you? Then come out of confusion and come into truth. Gather into the true family of God and study his word. Verse 9, if any man hath an ear, let him hear. I want to cover one more verse. 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Do you hear the true word of God? Then become a captive of the living Savior. Put on the gospel armor and be prepared to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. They're religious darts. Darts of conversion. Nothing to fear. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Do you remember Esau? Hates hey, part of it, friend. Esau was promised, you shall also become a strong nation, but you will live by the sword and you shall die by the sword. That atheistic, communistic, ungodly nation. What is the sword of the end times? Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. The tongue of the living Savior is a two-edged sword and he speaks from your mouth when you're delivered up. Do you have a destiny? Do you have a purpose? Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. That completes for this chapter 13, the religious beast. I don't like to call it a beast. It's a political system. If you don't recognize that, you'll never understand the book because God himself explained it so clearly in that chapter 17. In the next lecture, we're going into the religious beast and some of the shenanigans he will pull. Do you know what this religious beast looks like? It looks like the Lamb of God. It looks like that picture of Jesus that you have on your wall. That's why so many people will rush to him. They've been told all their life that Satan has two horns, that he dresses around in, in, in long red handle underwear and carries a pitchfork. Friend, don't believe it. That's, that's, uh, that's a lie. He's a very beautiful individual and is more convincing than anyone that you've ever heard speak. And I tell you this, 
you shall hear him speak and teach to this world in the very near future, in person, in the form that he's always wanted to fulfill, even as the king of Tyre, as he was supposed to be a protecting cherub of the mercy seat, the seat of Christ. He's going to take that seat. And many of you that do not have your name written in that book, that's why some write and say, may I join your church? Hey, you've got to take that up with him, friend. If your name isn't in his book, I can't help you. You've got to take it up with him. If he approves you, oh, you're all right with me. I'll ride with you right to the very bitter end. Not a bitter end, though. It's a wonderful, rewarding end. For as we read in chapter 17, we've got the victory. We have nothing to fear. Man only fears the unknown. Those little old puny tin horn king generals that are going to be set up, they're nothing. They can't even come to power on their own until Satan sets them up. And you're afraid of them when you serve and are a child of the living God, come off of it. Stay in the simplicity of God's teaching. In other words, take the babble out of your mind, the confusion, and let the clarity of the living God be the seal in your forehead that you cannot be deceived in these end times. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. We'll talk about the religious beast in the next system, <laughs> the next lecture. You'll find that his system is very simple. When you listen to your father's word, instead of men. God bless you. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Revelation, the word that means to reveal, to uncover in any language, what an inspiration to have it done chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's what this series of tapes does, takes you through the book of Revelation with clarity. And it is amazing when we understand the words that our Father has given us and those things that we can expect covering subjects such as who are the two churches out of the seven that pleased Christ? All others failed. Who were those two? What does the throne of God actually look like in appearance compared to the throne of Satan? Chapter 6 will give you Satan's throne. Chapter 4 will give you our Father's throne. And that mark of the beast, understand with clarity from the 13th chapter. The book of Revelation, I know you'll enjoy it. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered and the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say, in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the Mark of the Beast. Ecclesiastes, or some call the preacher. A book, certainly, that our Father sent us, rewarding us uh, as far as knowledge and how to live in these flesh bodies. Many people are disturbed by minor things and some major things. The book of Ecclesiastes tells you how to have peace of mind under all conditions. A book written especially by our Father sent to us to understand how to cope with this earth age and these flesh bodies. As it is written within this book, there is nothing new under the sun. What has been around still comes around. Teaching you the difference between the flesh, where it goes after death, where the soul goes after death. Certainly a must for everyone in this earth age. Don't miss the Ecclesiastes. Our our tapes, a $4 donation, I'm sure they will be rewarding to you. There are four tapes in this set, and I think you will find each one of them a blessing to you.
All right, bless your hearts. Hey, we're back. There's the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. And in this great state of Arkansas, 787-6026. you have a question or comment, you feel free to share it with the pastor. I just ask that you don't let would-be scripture lawyers, hirelings, mislead you. That you stick to our Father's Word and learn how to study it. Don't, it doesn't do any good just to read it if you don't understand it in the simplicity in, in which Christ teaches. So I, I just enjoy studying His Word with you. Let's get right into our prayers. We have many of them this evening. Know this, that many people call this a miracle. I don't. It's a promise from my Father, your Father. And I claim it. And He's real. Millie from California. Regina from Louisiana. Julie from Virginia. Grant from North Carolina. Richard from Indiana. Anne from California. Gail from California. Mike from California. An unnamed uh, concerning marital problems, uh, uh, that is to say, hoping to get married. Leave it in the Father's hands. Leave it in the Lord's hands when we put it there now. Carmen from California. Maria from California. And no name or state. Prayer for Mother. Okay. In her 70s. Mary from Florida. All right, Mary. Ruth from Alabama. Okay, Ruth and Oki from Tennessee. Father, you hear the request of the children. Father, we claim the promises. Your promises that are true and are real. We ask as our Father and provider and leader to touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Father. We love you so much. It is good. And when he answers prayers, it is his credentials that his word is true. His promises are true. Claim them. Okay, Margaret from California, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 24. Do we spiritually go into these seven things when we pray? Well, then it's, we're supposed to. All right, if you want your prayer answered, you will. And those of you that wish to check, it's those beautiful app attributes to the Christian that are listed in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 4. Christine, they said the devil was after my baby. Christine, I understand that you just got saved. Well, my darling, I want you to know something. Somebody's given you some false information. The devil can't bother your baby. Now, you take the power of the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, uh, and you tell him to go to, the, to, you tell these that would tell you this, and the evil spirits that are around them to go to hell. And you stand up in the blessedness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose shed blood is over you, dear child. You stop listening to those people. I want you to make a scriptural note. I'm going to say it twice for you so that you're a new Christian. I want you to get it. Luke chapter 10, start reading with verse 18. And go forward and understand that Jesus gave you power over all your enemies, including the dragon, including Satan, including the devil. You don't have to fear him. He's afraid of you. If you'll stand up like a woman of God, you do it. Susan from Alabama. Why do you believe there isn't a rapture? I am a congregational holiness. Uh, well, bless your heart, uh, because it isn't written. We're going to gather back with Jesus, all right, at the last trump. That is written. But when's the last trump? It's the seventh trump. After the two witnesses rise from defeating Antichrist, that is to say from the streets of Jerusalem, where their power of the witnesses, the true Christians that stand against the falsehoods that are coming soon, then will the trump sound and Jesus will be seen coming as they rise from the streets to that higher level of living and thinking. So shall we gather back to the Lord, but not until then. Don't let anyone confuse you otherwise. Chester from Florida. How did you figure out Christ's conception was on December the 25th? Do you use our calendar or the Jewish calendar? I use the Hebrew calendar. 
Do you stick to our calendar and change? Enjoy uh, your teachings, but this puzzles me. Well, it's the calendar of the moons, the months. Uh, our Christian calendar, if we want to call it that, in a sense goes by the moons. But of course you have to break it back to the Hebrew calendar. Make a note for me now. I want you to do it. First Chronicles chapter 24, verse 10. That's the course of Abiah. The priest of which uh, Zacharias was served on certain days. Then you convert that from the Hebrew calendar to, the, to our calendar. And it, it's very simple. Very, very simple. Okay? I hope you enjoyed it. If you have a companion Bible, you'll find a far more in-depth study than I gave on that subject in the appendix. Jeannie from Iowa Comment, on the eighth day, Adam, we thought he was created on the sixth day. And a comment, on the, comment please, on the three world ages. We just started to watch your program and we were very interested. Well, praise, your, praise uh, his name. I think after the last lecture on the three world ages taught from the book of Peter, I think I won't make a comment. It would be redundant for certainly there are three world ages. And if you study the first two tapes of Genesis that we have, you find that indeed God rested. The man he created on the sixth day, he gave, gave power over all the fishes and the wild animals. Then he rested one day and he created Hahadam in the Hebrew tongue, the Adam. He formed him, for he had no man to tend the soil. And... Um, and he placed him, if you would, in that position and then created other animals and brought them before the man and he named them. Those are domestic animals. Look at the word clearly and simply. Marvin from Ohio, you seem to teach the same thing as Herbert Armstrong. How do the two of you differ in teachings? Well, I've never really studied his work, so I couldn't tell you. I, I have no idea. I teach God's word. I would suppose that anyone that really taught the Word, that um, if they were good scholars, it, there should, they should uh, strike an accord somewhere along the way. Let there be no mystery in that. Um, am I saying I teach like him? I've never heard him teach. I don't know. All right? So don't make anything more of what I said. I can't answer it. I have no idea. John from Colorado. In Genesis, what did... What did uh, God mean when he said that man is made in his own image? What does the word image refer to? Well, it doesn't mean that the man is made in man's image. The, his own image meant in Yahweh's. The, the word in the Hebrew is Elohim, which means God and his children or his angels. He said, let's, it's the, the word image it can even be, if you take it back far enough to the prime root, you'd get phantom in the same image. In other words, they look alike. Let's make him look just like we do. He was made out of a different material, but the same God formed them as the angels. They were made out of a different material yet, but yet made exactly the same. Exactly the same to the point that when the children wandered in the wilderness 40 years in this earth age, they were able to sustain themselves on angels' food, which is to say manna, the same food the angels ate. Isidore from Mississippi, please give a simple explanation of the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin can only be committed by those that are in a position to commit it. And that is to say, to have riven, risen above, to have eyes to see and ears to hear, to know that the Holy Spirit is going to speak through us and to refuse the Holy Spirit the privilege of speaking through us against Satan and his cohorts is unforgivable in God's eyes. It's to deny the Holy Spirit, in other words. Okay, Grant from California. How long will the tribulation last? Grant, it was supposedly seven years, then three and a half years in two parts, but Revelation makes it very clear that it is broken down to a five-month period. Even more so, it's the time that the locusts are in that particular season, which is the months May through September. 
September comes on what day? Uh, September is that month in which the Feast of the Trumpets uh, exist. And the last trumpet shall sound and Jesus shall return. Uh, no one knows the hour or the moment. But Revelation 9 is your documentation. In Daniel 9, 24 and 26, it speaks of a seven-year tribulation. Do you agree with the seven-year period? Well, it was before it was shortened. Yep. Uh, but you're going to have to include another verse with that. You're going to have to go to the 27th verse as well. Is there a time gap in the 26th verse of Daniel 9? Nope, it's in the 27th. Um... And, and learn to, if you ever learn to read any one verse with understanding in the Hebrew tongue, let it be the 27th verse of Daniel. That's why that there is so much confusion in the New Testament concerning the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Because the 27th verse speaks of the desolator, not desolation. Desolation is a condition. Desolator is the Antichrist. This religious beast we've been studying about. Okay, Ed from North Dakota. Uh, I'm, I might say, Ed, hold up just one minute. I might say one more about this gap. Yes, there's a huge gap there. It goes all the way to this generation from that generation. Ed from North Dakota explained Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 23, soul and flesh is in the blood. Don't eat the blood. Ed, it's a little confusing in the way that it's written there in the Hebrew, but it basically means this. Whether you, were, uh, whether you were clean or unclean, which means whether you were a servant of God or not a servant of God, don't eat something with the blood in it. Because uh, it was for health reasons as well, because you had to bleed something when you killed it. Otherwise, they didn't have refrigeration at that time, so naturally it wouldn't keep, and it'd make you sick. It'd kill you. It was for health reasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is from FN in Canada. Um, a fact that uh, you may not have realized as yet is the frustration we go through here in Canada, a land of Ephraim. Well, praise God you know who you are, uh, who has not as yet produced a man of God who has the truth, and therefore we rely on our brother Manasseh for his spiritual edification. God bless you. I appreciate that. We appreciate you so much. Hey, there's a lot of them coming from there. And a lot of them are studying with us, and I love every one of you. God is, is um, in control, and our Messiah is returning soon. And just because there's a border between, we're still the same, and God uh, shall free us in the near future. Elizabeth from Missouri. Exodus 16, verses 32 and through 34, Yahweh tells Moses to save a jar full of manna, manna as a testimony and a proof to future generations of the experience in the wilderness. Aaron comes out of the uh, commandment, carries out the commandment. Now, my question is, what happened to the jar of manna? I bet the natural science scientist of today would love to scrutinize just one little crumb of it. Well, I bet they would too. But it's in the ark. The, which is scriptural, it's documented. It was placed in the ark with the tablets, okay? And there it is to this day. Okay, Rosella from, let's see, Rosella, where are you from here? From Illinois. Perhaps you could elaborate a little on the end time significance of Elizabeth hiding herself for a five months during her pregnancy with John the Baptist. That's an interesting, a very interesting question, Rosella. Uh, could it mean the five-month period that we're going to have to hide in a sense, yet come forth and witness? Well, well it's a possibility. Inasmuch as John the Baptist was symbolic and came in the spirit of Elijah, does it mean that Satan will have a five-month reign, but that John or the true Elijah will return six months before his appearing to help our people? It's possible. Let's hang on there. Ethel from Pennsylvania, are the people that have returned to the Father in the conscious or unconscious states? They're very conscious. Very conscious. Denise from California, the priest course during the Christmas time, please explain again, Abaya. Take it down, First Chronicles 
chapter 24, verse 10. That's a baya. It, however, it gives all of the courses in the Hebrew. My, uh, Michael from Texas. Um, the Lord pronounced ashes from where the Buddhists say when they reach. I, I couldn't make a comment on the Buddhist religion. I'm not an authority on it, and yeah, I have to must be very careful concerning that. But it's a good thought, Michael. Mary from Florida. I've enjoyed listening to the books of First and Second Peter. Well, bless you, Mary. I'm glad you. I sure enjoyed teaching them. That old fisherman is one of my favorites. Dennis from Indiana. I've heard it told that the world shall stand 2,000 years, and after that, no more promise. Is this true? No, it isn't. But I'll tell you where it comes from. Most scholars believe there will be 7,000 years in this earth age. We've almost completed six of them, 4,000 before Christ, 2,000 after. Then naturally the final thousand for the millennium. So and that's probably where you got the thought. Anne from California. Show is wonderful. Best thing that has come along in a long time. I've watched many evangelists. Well, I'm glad you love our teaching, Anne. We love you people there in California, and we enjoy being with you. Mike from Colorado, what does it mean when he made man in his image? Well, I, we've had that one before. I'm going to pass over it. Isaiah 53, where else does it say Christ went to, help for th went to hell for three days? In the books of Peter, we just completed. All right, bless your hearts. I see we're out of time, and I see that I've got another prayer here. Carolyn from Alabama. Father, touch, bless, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, bless your hearts, that does it for this evening, and we just, uh, we just thank our Father for the privilege of coming to you. I wish I knew what to tell you folks in California. We've been there a little over, almost two months now. I'd like to hear from you. We want to stay. Whether we'll be there after uh, January the 4th, I don't know. I need to hear from you. You need to let me know. We hope that all people will carry the weight of their own area. You pray about it. If we've taught you and you want us there, we want to be there till Jesus comes. You pray about it. We're brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. You support us. If we've taught you, help us. Most of all, stay in His Word. Every day and it's a beautiful day. Jesus is the living Word. Thank you for joining with us in today's study of God's Word. If you would like to hear today's message again on audio cassette, or if you would like to know some of the other deeper in-depth studies that Pastor Murray has covered, write for the free tape catalog. Write Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 727 36. And don't forget to mention Tape Catalog. Shepherd's Chapel also has a monthly newsletter letting you know what's happening at the chapel. So if you would like to receive this monthly newsletter, write to Shepherd's Chapel, Gravit, Arkansas, 727 36. Thank you for joining us. And join us again each Monday through Friday at this same time for Shepherd's Chapel.